Hi, my name is Zach. I work for Runa, and I'm going to be talking about event-driven programming and closure. And I'm going to be covering three main topics. Uh, the first will be the sort of inherent difficulties of both synchronous and asynchronous programming. The second will be how that pertains specifically to closure. And the third will be a potential way forward in the form of an event-driven data structure. So synchronous is very simple. I think that you're all pretty familiar with this. In this example, we get a request. We send that to the database. And then we wait for the result. And while we're waiting, underneath the covers, there's some sort of latch. We're waiting for a message from the database. But as far as we're concerned, we're just in a holding pattern until that result comes back, at which point we use that to generate a response and we return it. So this is easy. This is easy to read. It's easy to figure out what the flow of execution is. And the errors, if there are any, can be handled locally within the function, or they can be handled at some sort of outer scope. We have that choice, depending on how we want to structure our code. The equivalent asynchronous implementation is a little bit more complicated. This is the same general flow. We get the request, we query the database, and then we register two callbacks, one for the error outcome and one for when we get the result. If we get the result, we generate the response, we send it. But this is quite a bit more difficult just to read over. It's harder to figure out what happens when, what the sort of flow of execution is, and we have to handle the error locally. We have to explicitly handle the error outcome for a database query. If we were doing other stuff, we would have to have specific handlers for those as well. There's no way for us to allow it to just bubble out to some sort of outer scope. So something to think about, though, is that in modern services, typically we are just a front end for some other back end service. And so we're spending more time waiting for the data to generate a response than we are actually computing our response. And whereas in this one example, we only have a single data dependency, we're only querying one time to one source, typically you see a lot more queries going out, multiple queries to one database, multiple queries to multiple data sources. And so the way that we can really speed things up is to wait for as many things at once. We want to be as concurrent as we can be when we're trying to generate a response. And so we can do this synchronously. And the fork join model is uh, one that you're still probably pretty familiar with, and it's pretty simple. You get as far as you can go, you fire off a bunch of tasks to run concurrently, and then you wait for them to complete, at which point you continue. And so no great rocket science here. It's something that we can all kind of wrap our heads around. But this requires one thread to fire off the tasks and then one thread per task. And threads aren't free, or rather specifically system threads, system threads are not free. And we're dealing with the JVM here because we're in closure land. And so we need to be careful. We need to be wary of just firing off threads willy-nilly. So again, there's a fairly straightforward way to deal with this, which is a thread pool. We have a certain number of threads, which is allocated to some sort of system resource, maybe the number of cores, maybe the, number of mem the amount of memory if we're uh, doing some sort of locking operation within the threads. But in this particular case, it doesn't really matter. We can even have just a single thread, which is executing everything because it'll just go through them one at a time and you know we'll get through. But consider a more complicated case where within one of our tasks we further subdivide into other concurrent tasks. And you don't have to be the person who's doing this. All you have to be doing is calling some code where someone else is trying to be as clever as you and do more than one thing at a time. And because the thread pool is keyed to some sort of finite system resource, Typically, if you're not thinking about this or not being careful or just in general kind of following a, an agreed upon pattern, you'll use the same thread pool. And so in this case, we have two parent tasks, which are orange, and four child tasks, which are blue. And if we have three threads, this is great because we have two threads waiting at the parent tasks and they then enqueue four child tasks. And the remaining thread is able to turn through them one by one and then we clear and everything's fine. But if we have two threads, we deadlock because we're waiting on the blue tasks to complete and they never will. And this is a 
highly contrived example, but it illustrates something, which is that when you have data dependencies between synchronous tasks, and they're executing within the same finite number of threads, this is always possible. You just have to have a certain alignment of all the planets, and all of your threads are working on the parent tasks, and then you are just ground to a halt. And the sort of broader point is that this nice simple flow that I gave you at the beginning, the synchronous approach where everything's very linear, it starts to kind of break down when you are dealing with complex concurrency and complex data dependencies. And so what I'm going to submit to you is that while the asynchronous approach was kind of ugly and a little bit obtuse, it exposes an inherent complexity in dealing with things concurrently. Because when you're dealing with things asynchronously, everything is concurrent by default. When you make a request and you register your callbacks, you're then free to go off and do whatever you like while that's going on. And in the case where you have a highly coupled concurrent problem, this is not, for instance, handling a bunch of HTTP requests, which can go and do their own thing and aren't depending on each other, but when they are coupled, the asynchronous approach maps more closely to what's going on underneath the covers. It's a less leaky abstraction because you're not going to get bit just because you've chosen to simplify the problem in a particular way. Now, I don't want to try to say that one of these approaches is always the one to use. I don't have any sort of uh, skin in that game. It's just I think that you should always use whatever is most appropriate given how complex your problem is. And complexity is local when it comes to your code base. It's a local phenomenon. So you want to be able to use whichever one is more appropriate wherever you can. And so we think, I think rather, that interop should be easy, but more relevant to the topic of, the conference of this talk, um, we want to take asynchronous, which has a fairly high minimum bar of complexity, and try to bring that down to the point where it's as simple as possible. So with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about asynchronous programming. Uh, typically, you do something like this. This is the publisher subscriber model. You have an event that comes in. There are a certain number of subscribers that are listening for this event, and the publisher sends it out. And this typically looks something like this. You have a list of subscribers. And whenever you subscribe, you add the callback to that list. And whenever you publish, you iterate over all the subscribers, and you hand it the event. Now, something to realize here is that multiple threads can call publish at the same time. So you might have one callback being called on two different threads with two different types of data. Now, this is not always an issue, but we have to differentiate between ordered and unordered event streams. So if you consider a UI, that is very ordered because if you click on a text box and then start to type, you want to make sure that all the consequences of having clicked on that text box have been completely realized before you start to type, because otherwise we're losing keystrokes and everything gets very confused. But if we're just logging something every time an event occurs, we don't really care. In fact, we don't want to have to serialize on this. We want to be able to have as many threads doing this as possible because our publisher subscriber model is just representing the sort of stimulus response nature of this event happened, we want to log it. So something to consider is what happens when there are no subscribers? And this is pretty simple, actually. Nothing happens. The event just vanishes off into the ether. But let's consider that in the context of a real world example where we have a proxy server and we get a request and then we need to see whether we want to allow this request through. We have some sort of whitelist, which is in an external database. And so this is, again, pretty simple. It looks like this. We get a request. We check if the URL for this request is whitelisted. If so, we forward it. If not, we forbid it. So in Node.js, an HTTP request is split into the headers and zero or more body events. And in this case, we're going to assume that there is a body. It's a post or something like that. So we receive the headers. And we send the whitelist request, and we subscribe to the response. And if the response is in the affirmative, then we forward the headers, and we subscribe to the body, and forward the body as it comes in. 
But what happens if the body's already shown up? We weren't subscribed to it. We don't really know that one's going to show up before the other. And in this case, we've lost the request. We cannot be a proxy in this case. And so the fix for this is not too complicated. What you do is when the header comes in, you forward all the body events into a buffer. And when the whitelist response comes in, you handle the buffer. But this is a fundamentally different pattern because what we were doing before was pushing events to the subscribers. But now we are allowing ourselves to consume at our own leisure. This is a, an inversion of the standard publisher subscriber model. And for a somewhat more realized version of this, we can look at how Erlang would handle this. In Erlang, every process, which is a very lightweight construct, has a mailbox. And this is just a queue of messages that have been sent to that process. But in Erlang, you don't have to receive from the head of the queue. Instead, you can say what you want to receive. You have a pattern for the sort of message that you want to receive. So if in this case, we've received the header, and then we receive the body, and then we receive the whitelist, we're not constrained by the order in which these messages came in. Rather, we just give the pattern of the messages that we wish to receive next, and we are able to consume them in the way that we want to, in the way that allows us to actually know what we can do with the information. So I want to differentiate between the push and pull mechanisms. The publisher subscriber model is pushing events toward the subscribers. In the Erlang mailbox, we are pulling messages from it based on what we actually want to receive next. And the key thing to realize here is just because an event has been fired off doesn't necessarily mean we know what to do with it. And this is something that we need to keep in mind, especially when we're correlating messages from multiple sources. So again, to recap, event streams can be ordered or unordered, and they can be consumed using push or pull mechanisms. So when looking at closure, there are a couple of unique properties that we need to consider. Uh, data is immutable, state is transactional, and closure is thread agnostic. Now immutability is actually pretty straightforward. It's a huge help to us because when we are dealing with multiple subscribers receiving the same message, in many languages we would have to be concerned about whether one of these callbacks would alter the event in place before another subscriber would get to look at it, in which case this causes a little chain reaction that's very hard to predict because typically you don't know what order these subscribers are being called in. So the way that you get around this is just by convention you agree to never do that. You never modify the uh, event as it comes in. In Clojure, we don't have to rely on convention, which is nice. And so this is just, like I said, sort of uh, a very good thing. The software transactional mem uh, memory is a little bit more complicated. Uh, a transaction, if it hits a point where it becomes inconsistent, will simply restart. And since a lot of event handlers will actually do something, cause a side effect, they will write a message to the network, they will write to the console, they will append to a file. Uh, we risk, when publishing within a transaction, having that occur multiple times. And this pretty much won't ever do. So we need to have some sort of way of dealing with this. The last property is that closure is thread agnostic. And I, I know this is maybe not a uh, common computer science term. So what I mean by this is typically you need to be very concerned about where something is executed. When dealing with threads, there is a lot of convention. You have to worry about how the locks are being acquired. You have to worry about whether something is being run at the same time as something else. And closure, because of the immutable data and because of the transactional memory, allows you to not care in most cases. And so this is hugely freeing. This gives you a lot of sort of mental capacity back because you're not constantly worrying in the back of your head, what is this doing with respect to everything else? But if we give a publisher to another function with the intent of having it subscribe, and it defers that subscription onto another thread, then we have the same race condition that we had before, which is that if we don't subscribe in time, events just vanish. And all of a sudden, we're back in the realm of having to have conventions. We have to be worried about how a particular function that we're calling is going to deal with the data that we're giving it. And this is not 
a very happy state of affairs. And so we don't want this. We want to not have to think about this very hard. So if we were to describe our sort of dream construct for how to deal with events, we would want support for both push and pull because the pull is what allows us to get around this race condition. It allows us to say, I don't care when you're actually publishing this event. I only care when I want to consume it. We want to have an efficient mechanism for both ordered and unordered streams. We don't want to have to serialize on everything. We want to have the choice of whether or not something should be ordered or unordered. And finally, we want it to play nicely with transactions. So my solution to this, which is by no means the only or the best solution, is called a channel. And it represents a stream of messages. And messages in this case is just uh, the same thing as an event. It just makes more sense in the context of the structure to call the messages, so they're interchangeable. Messages are consumed by callbacks. So if I want to receive a message from this channel, I register a callback, and my callback will be invoked with the next message. If there are no callbacks when we enqueue a message, it remains within the channel. There's just an internal queue. And this queue is transactional. And this means that if we have a channel, and this channel has no callbacks registered, and we enqueue a message into it, within the scope of a transaction, we will not get duplicated messages. And so this means that if we simply define the messages within a transaction, but defer the consumption until outside that transaction, we no longer have to worry about duplicated side effects or anything like that. This is not a full solution, but it gets us most of the way. So for unordered message streams, we can use receive all. And receive all will hand a callback all messages currently in the channel and all future messages that are enqueued into the channel. And so this bypasses a queue entirely, which has some nice performance properties because dealing with uh, transactions can be a little bit expensive. So this just allows us to deal with unordered streams, allows multiple threads to enqueue into the channel at the same time, and has all those nice properties. For ordered messages, we have two options. We can either receive in order all messages enqueued into the channel, which means that the callback will only be called once, or rather one at, uh, one at a time for each message, or we can receive just a single message from the channel. Channels can be closed, and once it is closed, we can't enqueue any messages into the channel, but there still may be messages there. So we differentiate between when something is closed and when the channel is drained, which is to say that it's both closed and empty. And there are events for these that we can hook into. We can also close a channel as a result of an error. So this will implicitly close the channel, but it will also have an error that we can hook into and explains you know, the error condition that caused the channel to be closed. So there are functions that operate on channels, operators. And uh, a lot of them look fairly familiar. You have map, you have filter, you have reduce. You also have some things that don't really have a dual when it comes to sequences and closures, such as sample every, partition every, and siphon. And I'll be talking about some from both categories later in the presentation. When mapping a function over a channel, we have to consume all messages from that channel. So when I map the increment function over a channel that has 1, 2, and 3 enqueued into it, all those messages will be consumed. We will have a new channel, and into that will be enqueued 2, 3, and 4. We can chain these together. So in this case, we're incrementing all numbers, and then we're filtering out only the even ones. And that looks like this. We actually create two new channels here, one intermediate channel that represents the incremented numbers, and a final channel that's returned that has the filtered numbers. But consider what happens when we close the rightmost channel. Now, in queuing into a closed channel is a no-op, so it doesn't really hurt us. But n we're now ha processing this entire stream. We're incrementing all these numbers, and we're filtering all these numbers. And for what? It doesn't go anywhere. So we don't want to continue to have this operation when all it's doing is ending up sort of at the end of a closed channel. And so we want to stop filtering. But in that case, then, we have this intermediate channel, the middle channel. And messages are just accumulating there because they're not going anywhere. 
And this is anonymous as far as we're concerned. This is just some sort of interstitial construct that we were using to carry these messages along to the end. So the solution here is that when we close, this back propagates. So if we close this channel, we no longer have any reason to filter. So we disable that. But now, because this intermediate channel, we've stated that it exists to feed channels into uh, through this filter operation. It has no reason to be open anymore, so we close it. And then this continues backwards until finally the original source channel is closed. In a more complex case where messages from a channel are going more than one, uh, into more than one channel, if we close one of these, it will only go as far back as where the channels literally have no purpose. In this case, this channel still exists to feed into this other one, and so it won't be automatically closed. So channels and seeks enclosure, which is the sort of pervasive sequence abstraction, seem nominally sort of similar. They both deal with ordered data. They both are able to be terminated. But there are some fundamental differences that I want to point out because treating them as the same is dangerous. In a channel, the message exists once you enqueue it. It's in memory. It's realized. Whereas in a lazy sequence, you don't actually have a real element until you've consumed it, until you've iterated over it. So we can have an infinite lazy sequence. We cannot have an infinite channel. In a closure sequence, the, calling the same operator on the same sequence will always return the same value. So if we map increment over a sequence of 1, 2, and 3, it will return 2, 3, and 4 every single time that you call it. And it's, it's an idempotent operation. But because we consume values from a channel uh, when operating on it, calling map twice over the same channel will not necessarily return the same result. These are not idempotent operators. So the solution for this is that we can fork a channel. And forking a channel returns an exact duplicate that contains all messages currently in the channel that will contain all future messages enqueued into it. But consuming a message from one doesn't affect the other. So to be idempotent, we have to compose the forking and the operator. And this allows us to have the same result be returned every single time. When we close a fork channel, this does not affect the original channel, but closing the original channel will close all uh, derivative channels. We can also splice channels together. And all this means is that we have a proxy channel where every message that's enqueued is forwarded to one, and every callback that's registered is forwarded to another. And this may not seem very useful, but consider that channels are unidirectional. And some of the most useful communication is bidirectional. So if we want to model this, we have to pass around pairs of channels, which means that we have a bunch of bookkeeping. And if we mix these up, things get very confused and very hard to understand. But that's OK, because we can just splice these two channels together in two different orders. And now, every message enqueued into one will be received from the other and vice versa. It's like cups and string. So now, one half of this pair can be used to model a full duplex socket. And this can be very useful. Consider a very simple chat server where we have many bidirectional sockets and a single unidirectional broadcast channel. And every time we get a new socket, we siphon all messages from the broadcaster into the socket. And that just means that we take every message from one and put it into the other, and vice versa. So now, when we get a message, we forward it into the broadcaster. And the broadcaster has been linked to all the sockets, so it broadcasts it back out. And just like that, every message that goes into, comes from one source will go back into all sources. And this is actually quite powerful, because what we've done is instead of dealing with each message individually, all we've said is, here's what the flow of data should be. And so this is analogous to being able to map a function over a sequence rather than having to iterate over each element in turn. It's a higher level of abstraction when dealing with this. A result channel represents a single outcome. It's either a result or an error. And it's special in that 
It's just like a channel, it has the same interface, but when you enqueue a message, that's the only message that can ever be enqueued. But this value can never actually be consumed. You can receive it as many times as you like from it, but it will never go away. And this is actually our bridge to the synchronous world because we can simply dereference it. We can wait for the result with an optional timeout, and this will then hang until the result channel is realized. And if there is an error, then it will throw an exception, but otherwise it will just return the value. It will return the outcome. So let's say that we have a service that returns us a number. We don't know what it is. And we want to get the sum of two and that number. So in this case, we can hang until we have the number and then return the sum. But consider the converse of that, where instead we do some sort of transformation such that instead of returning the sum by waiting for the value, instead we just return a value that represents the eventual sum. So what we're doing is we're taking the asynchronicity, the eventuality of this value, and we're allowing it to contaminate everything else that it touches. And so for a sort of more practical demonstration of this, uh, consider the following uh, semi-real-world example. We receive a request, and we fetch the session data. And if the session doesn't currently contain the user history across all past sessions, we go fetch that. If the session doesn't currently have the user location, we go fetch that. And finally, we generate a response based on all these pieces of information. So the code looks a little bit like this. We have uh, the request, we fetch the session, we get the history unless it's in the session, we get the location unless it's in the session, and finally we generate our response. And in a synchronous workflow, we do one of these at a time. We get the session, we get the history, we get the location, and we generate the response. But that's not what the flow of data is. In this case, the request is used by the session, the history, and the location. And so we're able to get the session, and then this gives us enough information to get the history and the location. And finally, we can generate the response. And the key point here is that the history and the location do not depend upon each other. These are not dependent pieces of data. We're able to get them at the same time. And this is sort of going back to the idea of being able to fire off all these tasks, but this has certain sorts of problems, and so we're looking for a cleaner solution. And looking at the code, you can see that this perfectly expresses the data flow because the session only relies on the request. The expression that gives us the session only relies on the request. Similarly, the history relies on the session and the request, and so forth. So we don't need to have any sort of annotation that says this relies on that. Rather, the code tells us precisely where the data flow is. And so if we have this transformation I described, this async macro, it takes every expression, and instead of having it return a value, it returns something representing its eventual value. And the actual execution of the expression is deferred until everything it relies on has been realized. And if any of the things that it relies on emit an error, then it simply bubbles that error up. It, too, emits the same error. And so if we take this code that I just showed you and we wrap it in the async macro, we start with the request. Okay, the request is a real value. It's realized. And this gives us enough to get the session. And remember, the execution of the code is triggered by it, all the, the data that it depends on being available. So this is actually the order of execution. So we have the session. And this gives us enough to see whether or not the session contains both the history and the location. And it doesn't in this case. So we go and we fetch the user history and we fetch the user location. And the history shows up first and the location shows up second. And finally, we have enough information to generate a response. And so by simply following the flow of the data, we have exposed the inherent concurrency in this code. And we've allowed these things to go off and be queried at the same time, not by having to contort our code or change the structure or do anything that's not just a pure, simple, straightforward description of how we want to calculate something. But still, we're able to get at that concurrency. And as a nice byproduct of this, 
uh, we can wrap the topmost handler function in a try catch. And this will give us any error that occurred in the entire flow. Because just like normal synchronous code, exceptions will bubble up. So error handling, unlike in the sort of uh, very low level asynchronous example I gave you at the beginning, error handling does not have to be local. We can also, within the scope of the async macro, wrap something in task. And all that does is said, it says return result channel and execute this expression on a thread pool. And this is nothing special. There's the future macro in Clojure, which does much the same thing, except since within the async macro, result channels and actual results are effectively the same, we don't have to change the structure of our code to run it on another thread. Instead, this is just an annotation that tells us where it should be executed. And so this means that we have a lot more flexibility in terms of how we want to structure our code and playing around with different sort of approaches because it doesn't require that we're constantly refactoring things. We just need to wrap a scope and say this should be executed on another thread. And because asynchronous expressions don't hang around waiting for anything, the deadlock example that I gave earlier in the presentation cannot happen. Now you can do side effects asynchronously. In this particular case, we want to first query a moon base and we want to query a database. And because the moon is a little bit further away, chances are the database is going to come back sooner. So the only the thing about this, though, is that the moon base's response is not part of our data flow. We don't rely on this to return a value. And so it's not clear exactly what this means. This is a side effect, clearly. But if the moon comes back and says, I don't know what the hell you just said, that, ex the, that exception doesn't really bubble up anywhere. There's nowhere that we actually care about whether or not we succeeded. And maybe this is just fire and forget, and this is perfectly acceptable. But how do we know if there's an error? And in, within this scope, we do log if there's an error. But still, that's not necessarily encompassing the fact that we may actually want to make sure that this moon call responds and responds successfully, even if we don't rely on the data. And the way to accomplish that is that we can force the value. And forcing means that all subsequent expressions within that scope have to wait for that to complete. And if it fails, they don't even bother to try anything. They just fail as well. And so in this particular case, we will wait for the response from the moon base. We don't actually care what the response is. We only care about the database. But we care that it succeeds. And again, this is not a blocking operation. This just means everything is deferred one level deeper until the moon base has gotten back to us. So this is all fun, and this is all great. But uh, there are some problems. And one of them is that this is a completely opaque transformation that we're doing here. Um, when we execute a block of code within async, it returns a result channel. And eventually, hopefully, it gives us a result. But what if it doesn't? Or what if it's taking much longer than we thought it would, or whatever else? Then we have no way to really understand what's going on. If this were synchronous, there would be stack traces. We could do a stack dump. We could look at exactly where it's waiting. We could actually have a pretty good understanding of what's going on. In this case, if we're just waiting for something, nothing's happening. There are some callbacks registered somewhere, but those aren't very visible. And so this is difficult to debug. And it's difficult to understand what's going on. And furthermore, complicated things are still complicated. right? The code may be very straightforward, but if you have complicated data dependencies, the transformation is going to result in something that does a bunch of stuff that may not be immediately obvious or may not be something that you would even think to uh, look for. And so these are all genuine problems. And this is a work in progress. So one of the things that I want to do in, uh, in the future is try to at least put a salve on this problem. This is, again, a question of inherent complexity, so there's no silver bullet. But we want to be able to understand the intermediate progress of these asynchronous workflows at least a little bit better. And as a corollary of this, we want to be able to understand how distributed processes are communicating with each other using these primitives. Because this is just a larger variant of a similar problem, right? Understanding how all these distributed things are 
communicating with each other and how they're affecting each other is a very difficult problem. And if we have instrumentation that works for what are effectively distributed callbacks within the same process, my hope is that this translates. And you know, maybe not perfectly, but I think that this could still be a very valuable line of exploration. And finally, I'm very excited about ClojureScript, which is Clojure being executed, or rather being transformed into JavaScript. And these sorts of transformations, which allow us to deal with asynchronous workflows in a more straightforward way, translates very nicely to JavaScript and would potentially be very useful. I haven't had a chance to really explore this very much, but uh, I, I'm looking forward to when I do have the opportunity to. So all the code that was discussed here is in a project called Lamina. It's on GitHub. I encourage you to watch it and uh, you know give it a try. And it is used for practical effect in a project called LF, which uses these primitives to model network communication over a variety of protocols. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, the question was, can I describe briefly how the async macro works? Uh, no. But uh, I, this was actually something that I wanted to try to fit into the presentation, but it just it, it wouldn't fit. Um, there's a whole nother uh, line of functionality that deals with composing actions asynchronously called a pipeline. And uh, this works, the async macro works, by taking expressions and turning them into pipelines that are then piped into each other. And uh, it's, that's a whole other talk's worth of material, unfortunately. Does it try to make, I don't want to force you to explain the async macro, <laughs> but does it make any distinction between different kinds of expressions or does it make pipelines for every expression in the internal? Um, if everything is a constant value, if you're adding together two numbers, it does its best to try to not uh, turn that into a more complicated and less performant version of itself, but uh, it's not super smart. The idea is that you're not turning your entire code base into something with the async macro. This is some sort of top level control flow mechanism. Uh, functions that are called by the async macro aren't, don't suddenly magically become asynchronous. They can be as performant as they ever were. You just really want to have this be sort of a top level way of dealing with all the different things that you're trying to do. The question was, uh, does it do code walking? And is it compatible with macros within itself? And the answer is yes, it does code walking. And it does macro expand on everything within it. And uh, so there's actually an additional sort of some uh, sort of scary bits that happen when you do something like four, which generates lazy sequences, which cannot be asynchronous. They have to actually be realized. And so that's probably some of the least tested part of this. And it seems to work in the test cases I can come up with. But I, I do fear for there being something that will bring it to its knees. Uh, is that it? Uh, all right, thank you.